20 years ago, you could still see at the southeast corner of the Place de la Bastille, near the dock of the canal dug out of the old moat of the prison citadel, a bizarre monument that has already been wiped from the memory of Parisians, yet they deserve to leave a trace there, for it was something that a member of the Institute, commander-in-chief of the army of Egypt, no less, had come up with. We say monument, though it was only a model, but this model itself, a wondrous first draft, the grandiose carcass of an idea of Napoleon's that two or three successive gusts of wind had whisked away and deposited each time further away from us, had become historic and had taken on something indefinably final that contrasted with its provisional look. It was an elephant, 40 feet high, built out of plaster on a timber framework and carrying on its back a tower that resembled a house. It was once painted green by some dauber, but was now painted black by the sun, the rain, the weather. In this deserted and open corner of the square at night, the broad forehead of the Colossus, its trunk, its tusks, its tower, its enormous rump, its four legs like columns, was startling and terrible silhouetted against the starry sky. No one knew what it meant. It was a sort of symbol of the force of the people. It was grim, enigmatic, immense. It was a mysterious and mighty phantom, one visible standing next to the invisible specter of the Bastille. Few foreigners visited this edifice. No one walking by looked up at it. It fell into ruin. Every season, bits of plaster broke off its flanks, leaving grisly wounds. The town councillors had left it to rot since 1814. It stood there in its corner, mournful, diseased, disintegrating, surrounded by a rotting, paling fence, pissed on at every turn by drunken coach drivers, cracks zigzagging up its belly, a lathe stuck out at its tail, weeds were pushing up between its legs, and as the level of the square had been rising all around for thirty years, due to that slow yet never-ending movement that imperceptibly raises the ground of great cities, it now stood in a dip, as though the earth were subsiding under it. It was filthy, despised, repulsive, and superb, ugly in the eyes of the bourgeois, melancholy in the eyes of the thinker. It had a feel of garbage about it to be swept out of the way, and a feel of royal majesty about to be decapitated. It looked different at night, though, as we were saying, night is the true medium for all that is shadowy. As soon as twilight fell, the old elephant was transfigured. It took on a peaceful yet awesome look in the formidable serenity of the darkness. Being a thing of the past, it was one with the night, and this obscurity suited its grandeur. Its use was to take in the innocent that society drove out. Its use was to lessen society's sin. It was a retreat open to one to whom all doors were closed. It seemed that the miserable old mastodon, invaded by vermin and oblivion, covered in warts, patches of mold and ulcers, tottering, worm-eaten, abandoned, condemned, a kind of colossal beggar asking in vain for the alms of the benevolent, look in the middle of the crossroads, had alone taken pity on this one other beggar, on this poor pygmy who went off with no shoes on his feet, 
with no roof over his head, blowing on his fingers to warm them, dressed in rags, fed by what everyone else throws out. That was the use of the elephant of the Bastille. This idea of Napoleon's, scorned by men, had been taken up by God. What would have been merely illustrious had become august. To achieve what he had in mind, the emperor would have needed porphyry, bronze, iron, gold, marble. To God, the old assemblage of boards, joists, and plaster was enough. The emperor had had an idea of genius in this titanic elephant, armored, tremendous, holding up its trunk, carrying its tower, and causing joyous, invigorating water to spurt all around him. He wanted to embody the people. God had made something grander out of it. He had housed a child in it.